Well, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, real quick, while the offering's going by, last week we highlighted a few ministries uh, with an insert in the bulletin, and uh, we have them still available at the event center. And so if you missed last week or you were here and you're still thinking about it, we encourage you to get involved somewhere here at New Hope. And there are three ministries that we're highlighting. There's many that you can be a part of, but these three is, is where we're looking for some extra help. So uh, we're looking for some people that would help out in the coffee area on Sunday mornings just for like a couple 30-minute windows, maybe once or twice a, a month type of thing. Um, we're looking for some people that would help like we took communion today. It didn't just show up. The few individuals uh, come here for less than an hour once a month and, and get it ready. And also the parking lot, um, even on a rainy day like this, our, our team is out there and they're directing traffic. They're driving the golf carts for those who need assistance, that kind of stuff. I mean, if, if any one of those are a way that you want to jump in and get involved, go to the event center, pick up this white piece of paper. There's emails on there. You can contact uh, the people in charge, see myself. Uh, we'll get you information. So we want you uh, to be there. Um, so 1953, Pastor Weaver was born, right? Where are you at, Pastor? Oh, there you are. You're hiding, okay? Uh, he's sitting with his students to feel young today. That's good. <laughs> so in, in uh, 1953, uh, he's a big Yankees fan, and uh, that year they won their fifth straight World Series title, which is pretty cool. Uh, the first co color TV went on sale for just over $1,000 for a color TV. Uh, the average annual salary was four grand. Gas was 20 cents a gallon. That would be wonderful today. Um, and a new car, if you went out and bought a new car back then, it was about 1600 bucks. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, but I bet Pastor Weaver doesn't know that when he was a boy, the Dead Sea was only sick. Uh, Pastor, Pastor, when you were little, did anybody like come up to you and say, when you were a boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did anybody you remember? You probably don't remember. I'm guessing somebody did. I'm wondering, was wrinkled one of them? <laughs> or bald, one of the two? So since I, I turned um, over a new leaf last week in my, my age, um, I wanted to look up some advice. What is it going to be like when I'm 65? And so um, I found out that you sleep more soundly at 65. It just happens in the afternoon when that takes place. <laughs> um, I, I was encouraged, and I want to encourage Pastor Weaver today, that uh, 65 may sound old, or older, I should say, but in dog years, he's 455, so 65 is nothing. Uh, when you're 65, rock and roll no longer describes your genre of music, but it describes your chair options, rocking or wheel. Um, I have heard at 65, your joints do a better job at predicting the weather than the National Weather Service. So that's one thing to look forward to. So uh, the good thing is, is now that he's 65, his kids, Taylor and Austin, they have more time to babysit him. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, in all sincerity, Pastor Weaver, we love you. I know Pastor Jeff said it again. We love you. You are a, a friend to strangers and to anybody. Um, and I can promise you that when you talk to him, your secret is safe with him. It's because he doesn't remember it. <laughs> but... <laughs> All right. What do you need? <laughs> All right. Uh, a quick, a quick prayer request. I can't repeat that, but a quick prayer request. Um, just. Uh, Robin Murphy, uh, her mom had a stroke this morning, I'm guessing. So uh, let's, let's pray for her real quick. God, we pray that you would be with Robin's mom, that you would bring healing, speedy healing, and in, in the powerful name of Jesus, give the doctors and nurses the wisdom that they need. We trust you, God, and we thank you. In your powerful name we pray, and everybody said amen. All right, so two weeks ago, Pastor Weaver preached a great message. Uh, we're in the middle of a series this summer called Who You Say I Am. So I encourage you, be here on Sundays this summer. If you're gone because you're out of town or something like that, you can go back online and listen. Last week, Pastor Jeff preached a great message. So um, go back and listen to those. But I encourage you, take notes. Um, 
go back throughout the week on the, the scriptures that are shared on Sunday mornings and study them even more. Uh, share with somebody, your small group, your Bible study, your Sunday school class, your family members, uh, how you're growing in your faith. It's good to talk about it. It's good to reflect. Don't let Sunday morning be the only time uh, that, that you get a spiritual meal. Um, so we're in this series, and the series is titled, Who You Say I Am. So we want to look at what God's Word says of who we are, who we are in Christ. The Bible has a lot to say about that. But we also want to take a moment and bring understanding that for everything that God says that we are, there's a lie that the enemy tries to get us to believe. Would you agree with that? There's lies that are always being spewed out, and uh, we want to bring understanding, some clarity to that. Um, so that's why I encourage you to write down these scripture verses. They're, they're very good, they're very powerful. At the end of t- the message today, Man, I'm asking us to respond, whether you come to this altar, you respond where you're at, respond with your heart in prayer and worship. Um, Before the busyness of the day takes place, before the busyness of of this week takes place, before you head back out into the rain, would you take a few moments and and reflect and be uh, in God's presence even more? Uh, So the Bible has a lot to say uh, to us about who we are in Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to get there in just a moment. One of the titles that a Christian is given is this word called ambassador. And I want to look at that uh, for a little bit today, uh, because who we are in Christ, we are an ambassador. An ambassador is someone who represents a group of people. Um, Most of us are familiar with an ambassador representing our country. They are an authorized representative or authorized messenger. Um, So our governor, um, Terry Brain said, now is the ambassador to China. And so he is there. He's living in that country. Uh, It's a temporary um, assignment, but it's a special assignment. He's there representing us. He's representing um, our government, the president. He's engaging with the people there. Um, So he has this this assignment that's been given to him to represent interests, the policies of the United States, to keep talks going with that country. Um, An ambassador, though, is not set and free to be able to make their own policies. An ambassador cannot create their own messages. They have to uh, abide by the policies given to them from the United States. Um, In Washington, D.C., there's close to 177 foreign countries that have their embassies there in D.C. If you've ever been to D.C., it's a very busy place. Uh, The United States has close to 140 ambassadors representing us in foreign countries. George Shultz, when he was Secretary of State during the Reagan administration, he kept this large globe in his office. And so when a newly appointed ambassador would come in and they would have a meeting with him, or when uh, an, an ambassador was coming off the field, they would have a meeting with him. Every time they left his office, he would put them to the test a little bit. And he would say, I want you to go over to that globe and I want you to show me uh, your country. And so the, the ambassadors would go over and they would find the country that they were sent to and they would place their finger on that and then say, that's, that's my country. Um, but when former Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was appointed ambassador to Japan, um, he was put to the test, just like everybody else. He spun the globe, he found the United States, and he said, that's my country. And uh, Schultz says, man, he, he hasn't forgotten that. He tells that story to all the ambassadors coming and going. He says, never forget that you are over there in that country, but your country is the United States. You are there to represent us, to take care of our interests, and never forget it. And I want to remind us here today that this is not necessarily just our only place to be. We are citizens of heaven, true? We are just passing by. This is a moment of, of part of eternity that we're here. And uh, man, we want you guys to know that you are citizens of heaven as you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is sharing, and I want to get to uh, just the meat of what we're talking about today. Follow along with me, starting in verse 16. He says, So from now on, We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 
It's as if though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God, we thank you for your word. You see every heart, you see every need, and you see where everybody is at spiritually. Meet people today in your wonderful name. Amen. So Paul, in verses 16 and 17, real quick, he kind of is describing um, what Christ has done for us. He has reconciled us. He's made us new. He's given us new life. We are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And then in verses 18, 19, and 20, he's telling us that because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, he has now given us that ministry of reconciliation. He wants us to take that message to people that need him. He has entrusted us to share the good news with other people. So he uses this word reconciliation. And real quick, I just want to bring some clarity to what it means. It refers to the end of hostility. So if you've ever been at odds with somebody, you've ever had to, you know, end a hostile relationship, or maybe you just had to come to terms with somebody, you reconcile. That's reconciliation. And in the biblical perspective, it means this. It's coming to terms with God, of ending the hostility between God and humanity, restoring the right relationship between God and humanity. That's reconciliation. That's what Paul is saying. Because of what Jesus did, he provided the means for reconciliation. His suffering made it possible for peace between God and humanity. And God wants a right relationship with us. And in verse 19, um, Paul says that God was reconciling the world. The world in, in the Hebrew refers to people who are estranged from God. They're under the influence of sin and of the devil. That's, that's what Paul is saying. He says, we are an ambassador to the world, people who are estranged from God. And then in verse 20, Paul uses this word ambassador. Something very interesting that I found out this week of, of the context of kind of what Paul is, is saying here. In the Roman Empire, there's two kinds of prov- provinces, a senatorial province and an imperial province. The senatorial province was a province of peace. The people there were, were not at war. They were not at war with Rome. They had surrendered and they had submitted. But the imperial provinces, they were not peaceful. These, these provinces um, were prone to rebel at any time. And they were willing, you know, uh, to be able to rebel. And so the reason why Paul says, I'm an ambassador, is because he, you know, he saw that an ambassador from Rome went to these provinces to, 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 try, to try to create peace and, and uh, bring, uh, ensure peace. Don't worry, I have seven pages of notes, so the rain can come. We're good to go for a while, guys, all right? So this ambassador had, uh, was sent straight from the emperor to these provinces to bring peace, to end hostility, to bring others into the family of the Roman Empire. And Paul sees himself, and he sees you, and he sees me as ambassadors, as people who are bringing a message of peace, bringing a message of salvation, of good news, to, to reach people so that they can become citizens of heaven and they can come into the family of God. That is why Paul uses this word ambassador. And as an ambassador, I have two thoughts about it. The first one is this, we are authorized. You can write that down, authorized. Verse 20, Paul says, it's as if though God were making his appeal through us. As an ambassador, you have the authority from the group that you represent. You have the authority from the United States to uh, follow policies and, and regulations and whatever it may be. And your authority comes straight from the Oval Office, from the President of the United States. You are authorized to follow through with policies and messages and the jobs given to you. And as ambassadors, listen closely, you are sent, you are empowered from Jesus Christ. He has sent you. It's as if God were the one speaking through you. Paul says, I implore you, I beg you, be reconciled. And as an ambassador, we have authority from God Almighty. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, salvation took place. But you know what else took place? A commissioning service happened. And it's as if God uh, commissioned you and said, now go and take this message, this reconciliation that's happened to you personally, and go and tell other people about it. 
the Bible doesn't leave room for suggestions, like if you have time to do this, it says, no, you're, you need to do this. Same for you, and it's same for me. And I want you to notice something, that you don't have to have a college degree for this, right? You don't have to have a six-month window, trial window, when you give your life to Jesus to make sure you're perfect enough before you can go out there. No, you have the authority from God Almighty. But guess what? The lie from the enemy is this, is that you're not qualified. I'm not qualified. Has anybody ever felt that before? I'm not qualified. You've been told that lie. You're not good enough. You don't know enough about the Bible that your, your past is too messed up. Complete lies. John 8, 44 says, uh, that tells us that Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. The Bible over and over again tells us that he wants to um, deceive us, that he is a liar. He's here to steal, kill, and destroy. Nothing true comes out of his mouth. There's no truth. But listen very closely to this. Yet we listen to him. And we believe him. And because we listen to the lies and because we believe the lies, that keeps us from ever stepping foot onto the foreign ground of our spiritual world because of those lies. It's as if we stay within the confines of the embassy. We never leave to engage with and impact our culture. Listen, lies paralyze us. And when we are paralyzed, we are not living in the authority given by Jesus Christ. You know what the truth is? One scripture I want to share with you, Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And now he's about to give it to you. He's about to give it to me. He gave it to his disciples. Jesus had the authority from God Almighty. And now he's saying, I want you to do this. And he says, Go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Man, powerful truth right there. Authority was given to Jesus, now he's given it to you. He's given it to me. The Apostle Paul is a perfect example for this. One day he's carrying letters of, of arrest, to arrest Christians, to persecute Christians. He's approving of their death. He watches their deaths happen. And then one day he's on a road and he meets Jesus. He's blinded. And within just a few short days, he is now preaching for Jesus. One day he's preaching against, now he's preaching for Jesus. I don't see a college degree in there, do you? I don't see a six-month trial window in there, do you? No, he was commissioned, he was sent, he was empowered by the, the Holy Spirit to do this. Listen, don't believe the lie that you are not qualified. The Bible is full of stories of people who have messed up. They have had major pitfalls, and God still used them. Your sin is no match for the grace of God. Do not let that be a, a disqualifier for you, where you sit back and say, man, but I did this and this and this. Yeah, but have you considered the grace of God and the power of God and the author authorization that comes from God? So please hear me. There are individuals in your life and in my life, they are living in what we would call an imperial province. They are rebelling towards God. You and I are ambassadors. We have the authorization. And the best thing is, it's straight from the throne of God. We don't have to wait for, for authorization from Pastor Weaver to do this. God has given it to you when you place your faith in Him. Charles Spurgeon said, we are doing business for the King of Kings. We don't come in our name. We don't come in the name of any church or of any other persons. We come in the name of the one who created the heavens and the earth and who governs all things. We cannot afford to be paralyzed by lies any longer, church. You are authorized. The second thought is this. As an ambassador, we are an agent. We are an authorized agent. We have a, a very special assignment. We have an important assignment to share, an assignment, a message of reconciliation. Paul says, because Christ has reconciled you, he's now given us this ministry, this job, this assignment for us. Why do we need to be reconciled? Colossians 1.21 says, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. There are so many people who are not citizens of heaven. They're not in the family of God. They are, haven't come to peace in their relationship with Jesus, and they're still rebelling against God. A long time ago, Charles Spurgeon preached a message about being an ambassador, and here's one of the, the quotes that he shared. He says, so then there is war between man and God, 
It seems preposterous that man should be in arms against his God, but it is all too sadly true. Shall the gnat contend with the flame? Shall an insect fight against an angel? Even this would not be so absurd as for man, who is utterly insignificant, to make a war with God, who is infinite. Man, who is but as the ephemera of an hour, to enter into the list against the dread, eternal, and almighty God. And listen to what he says. God has constantly returned good for evil. He is still the God of love. Yet man has continued to fight against him, and there's still war between heaven and earth. Otherwise, there would be no need for ambassadors between God and men. God isn't the one creating war here. It's sin. God is extending love. He's extending through Jesus Christ love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. Yet we still tend to, in our hearts, create this hostility. And I encourage you today, if you're in a spot where you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, you you sense you're living in what we would call that imperial province. You're rebelling against God. Man, stop. Today, come to peace with God. Come to that right relationship with Jesus Christ. He's begging you. I want you to know that the job of an ambassador is not going to be easy. It's not always going to go the way you want it to go. You won't always be sent to the people or to the people group or to the job that you want. But that doesn't mean that you quit. Jonah in the Bible, he was called to go to Nineveh. If you haven't read about him, read him this week. Jonah had a wrong attitude towards God's will. And here's where it came from. He felt that God was asking him to do something impossible. God sent him to Nineveh. And he, God wanted Jonah to go and to give the city an opportunity to repent. But Jonah would much have rather seen them destroyed. He didn't like them. He, he, he had no love for them because they were enemies. They had persecuted and they had abused Israel. And so Jonah's narrow patriotism took precedence over his theology. Jonah's attitude towards God's word was a take-it-or-leave-it attitude, not the attitude of an ambassador. We don't get to choose who can receive God's grace and mercy. God does. Last time I read my Bible, it says, for God so loved the world. And in fact, just a few verses before what we just read in 2 Corinthians, Paul twice said Christ died for all. So we don't choose um, who receives God's grace and mercy. God's love isn't based on the level of rebellion. It's not based on skin color, nationality, or how much money is in your bank account. So think of the opposite of Jonah. There's Paul in the New Testament. Paul in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. Seems like just some basic scriptures, but they're so powerful. He says, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what's going to happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Paul was compelled by the love of Jesus Christ to go and to share this good news with Jews and Gentiles, to every person. He knew that wherever he would face hardships and possible death. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 14, um, Paul and Barnabas, they had, uh, through the power of Jesus Christ, they had seen someone miraculously healed. And so that crowd there began to like worship them and, and lift them up as saying, you are gods. And Paul and Barnabas are trying to um, calm that down and, and give the credit to God. And as they're doing that, here's where we pick up. And so a friendly group turns quickly into something else. Verse 19 says, Then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium uh, won over the crowd. They stoned Paul and they drug him outside the city, thinking that he was a dead. That's a bad day right there, right? You get beat up so bad, they drag you out, think you're dead. That's not a good thing. But check this out. But after the disciples had gathered around him, Paul got back up and he went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. I mean, being an ambassador is not going to be easy. And I I don't think we're at the level of facing death and persecution yet here. But as an ambassador, you're facing difficulties. Are you willing to still go with that assignment? When, When the world rejects you and you talk about Christ, they're really rejecting Jesus. The Bible tells us that. So here's the lie. It's an impossible task. As an ambassador, it's an impossible task. 
that they're not going to listen to you, that you're going to put yourself in danger, your, your family in danger. If you talk about Jesus, you could lose your job. And so what happens is this, is we turn into like Moses, and we give God all these excuses of why we can't, shouldn't, and won't do what he's asking us to do. And so think about this. We are telling the God of the universe, the God who created everything by the breath of his mouth, by the words of his mouth, the one who has named the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of stars by name, that it's impossible. In reality, that's what we're doing. That's the lie that we believe. It's impossible. But can I give you the truth today? Write these scriptures down as we'll read through them really quickly. Jeremiah 32, 17. Our sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Luke 1, the truth of God's word says, for nothing is impossible with God. Mark 10, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Romans 8, 31, what shall we say then? If God is for us, who can be against us? I know we've read these verses over and over again, but yet the lie rings louder than the truth. Don't believe the lie. Here's the great thing about the job of an ambassador, the agent that we are, is we are the messengers. We bring the, the, the good news. We bring the, the peace terms. Jesus is the one who reconciles. It is not you that reconciles. It is Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying don't have compassion and you just, you know, make a blanket statement and say, well, that's up to them. Now, Jesus has to do the rest. No, you have to have a compassion through it. But I want you to know Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You can't reconcile in your own strength. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not educated enough to do this reconciliation job. It is Jesus Christ. It is the power of Jesus Christ. A church membership won't. Being part of a political party won't. Through Jesus, the Bible says that we are made new. It's through Jesus that the old is gone. It's through Jesus that the new has come. We are made new and a new creation because of who? Jesus, let's try that again. We are made new because of who? Jesus, that's right. Jesus is the one. The worship team would join me. John 3, 16 and 17. Very familiar passages, but I want to read them again. I don't want you to listen to this in the context of what Jesus has done for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Notice, God didn't send his, his son into the world to create war, to condemn, but to save to be an ambassador. Jesus was an ambassador. Jesus was sent from the authority of God Almighty, from the throne room of God. Jesus was sent to create peace, to bring a message, to save us. He, Jesus came to a rebellious and hostile situation. Why? Because he loved us so much, to restore that broken relationship. And before we leave this place today, like I said at the beginning, if you are in a rebellious spot in your heart and you know that you need to be right with God, in just a few moments, please respond to God. Even now where you're at, would you respond to Jesus Christ? Just like Paul says, I implore you, be reconciled. Listen, I implore you today, be reconciled with God. We don't know the day or the hour that we will be called, that our life here on earth will be no longer. So be made right. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's with your heart that you believe and it's with your mouth that you confess. It's not a, a college degree. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? And as you stand, would you close your eyes? And if any one of our prayer team members are here, you can feel free to come at this time too. But man, this offer of reconciliation is extended to every person here today. If you're in a spot where you know you need to be in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, if that's you, 
I'm asking you, not only in just a moment to respond in faith and prayer, you can come to this altar and we'll pray with you, but if that's you, would you respond by raising your hand so we can be praying for you this week? I need to be in a right relationship with Jesus. Thank you for being honest. Thank you. Jesus Christ is imploring you, be reconciled. Be reconciled. Be reconciled. Come to terms of peace. Would you pray with me before we go any further? Jesus, you love every one of us, and I pray, especially for those who have responded, whether by hand or in their hearts, Jesus, that you would make them a new creation today, that they would no longer be walking in a rebellious state, in a rebellious province, but they would come to peace with you, Jesus. Because of what you've done, God, we can be made new. We can be made right with you. So I pray that you would remove the old and you would replace it with new today. Help them to trust you every day. Jesus, we need you. If you responded this morning, I'm asking you to, in your heart, continue to respond. With eyes closed, real quick before we sing, if you have been paralyzed from the lie that you're not good enough, you've believed that lie that you're not qualified, that your past is too messed up, or you've believed that lie that being an ambassador is impossible, you'd rather be comfortable than do the work of an ambassador, you've believed those lies and today you're tired of it and you realize it and you recognize it and you're saying, man, before I leave this place, I wanna, I wanna come to terms and, and realize and come back to the truth of God's word. And that's you, would you respond by raising your hand and say, God, that's me, I'm responding. I don't wanna believe these lies any longer. I wanna believe your truth, I wanna walk in your truth. God, we need you. God, we want to be ambassadors for you. We want to walk in your authority. As we sing today, would you respond? You're welcome to come to this altar. I encourage you. But respond today as an act of faith to restore your relationship with Jesus, to stop believing those lies, and to resume the work of an ambassador. Jesus, today, work on hearts. Jesus, today, reconcile. Jesus, today, let your truth be louder than the lies because we walk in your truth. We love you, Jesus. Have your way.